So, good afternoon, friends. Uh, we now start with the, the presentation on aircraft component nomenclature. So, today our task will be to familiarize you with some of the major components that go on the aircraft. In general, the aircraft can be divided into assemblies, sub assemblies, parts, and then you can go down to very, very small parts. But a component in the aircraft actually means something like an assembly. Okay. So, I will not go into rivets and bolts and nuts, but I will go into major parts like wing, fuselage, tail, etcetera. So, let us see what are the components that we could cover in this presentation. So, we will of course cover the wing, which is the main component. We will proceed with the fuselage of the body, empennage or the tail. And then we will go to miscellaneous. Now, this miscellaneous word is a very dangerous word. Okay. Miscellaneous can mean anything. So, let us define very soon what do you mean by miscellaneous. But before we start, it is important for you to understand that we follow a particular axis when we talk about aircraft. Each of the three axes moves about the center of gravity. The aircraft's principal axes are normal axis, that is a vertical from axis, top to bottom, lateral axis, along the wings, parallel to the wings, and longitudinal axis, drawn from tail to nose. Each axis is perpendicular to the other two axes. Let's look at each individually. The rotation about lateral axis is called pitch. This movement nose changes up, the nose down. direction it's called pitch. of the aircraft's nose. Pitching. The rotation about normal axis is called yaw. This is the movement of the nose of the aircraft from side to side. Side to side movement of the nose is called as a yaw. The rotation about the longitudinal axis is called roll. This is the movement of the aircraft's wings. One wing goes up, the opposite wing goes down. So, in summary, these are the three principal axes of movement. So, in this presentation and also in the entire course, we are going to use these three axes and these three pitching moment of the, these three moments pitching rolling and yawing you have to appreciate what they are and remember this particular video right so the first component of the aircraft that i want to touch about is the wing which is the major component okay without wing it's very difficult to have an aircraft so here is a photograph of the wing as it looks from a particular window and you can see that the wing is not just one single piece it contains several sub assemblies a few of these assemblies are visible in this photograph through the window now there are two edges so we will see which edge we will see which parts of the wing move and which parts remain stationary and we'll see if we have missed something okay so let's see first the wing has two edges, the leading edge and the trailing edge. So, the leading edge is the one that hits the air first. It leads. The trailing edge is the one that comes later. Okay. And if you cut the cross section of the wing, the profile that you get is called as an airfoil. If you are in the US, it is airfoil. If you are in Europe, it is aerofoil. So, it is the same thing actually, whether it is an airfoil or an aerofoil. Once again, remember, if there is something not clear, I would request you to please interrupt me. So, let us see the two wings in photographs. We have the leading edge as seen from one of the windows. Why is the leading edge? Because it is in the front. How do I know? Because I can see the engine cowling below, the engine covering below. And the one on the trailing, the one on the right is the trailing edge, which is the rear portion. And on the trailing edge, there are certain things jutting out, which we will very soon learn about. Okay. Now, the wing is basically the device that produces the maximum lift. 
and these uh, devices are mounted or the wings are mounted on the fuselage normally and there are some flight control surfaces mounted on the wing which help us in controlling the flight. We also have some high lift devices which are basically meant to increase the lift. So, if you have better lift you have better takeoff and landing performance, but there is also some other purpose of those. So, first we will look at the wing and the controlled surfaces on the wing. Okay. So, we look at this first. The one which is extremely outboard is the aileron. It has a specific function. Then if you just see what the aileron is, we will see how it works. Roll is when we bank or turn the aircraft wings. Turning the control yoke right or left will cause the aircraft to bank in the same direction. This is accomplished with the ailerons, hinge surfaces out on the far end of each wing. They are similar in function to the elevator, however they work opposite each other. One goes up while the other goes down. The downward deflected aileron lifts the wing while the upward deflected aileron drops the opposite wing. This simultaneous lifting and dropping causes the aircraft to roll in the direction we desire, thus turning the airplane. So, do you understand ailerons always work together but in opposite directions. They are internally linked. So, when one aileron moves up, the other aileron moves down. The one that moves down generates more lift. The one that moves up actually pushes that wing down. So, one wing is going down because of the air acting on it. And you can also assume that the other wing is going up because of the air acting on it. So, together they create a moment which overcomes the roll inertia and turns the aircraft or rolls the aircraft in the direction that is needed. Now, if in large aircraft we may have aileron split into many components, usually we have an inboard aileron and the outboard aileron. So, why do you think we need to have a breakup in the two ailerons? What could be the reason? Anyone can uh, try to answer this question? I mean, in case of failure. In case of failure, then there is one aileron available. But in case of failure, you mean to say this is a backup? No, no, no. We do not have inboard outboard ailerons uh, for a backup purpose. Please pass on the mic. Why is that different along the length of the wing? No, my question is why do we break the aileron into two parts, inboard aileron and outboard aileron, which is there on each wing. Each wing has an inboard aileron coupled to the inboard of the other side. Each wing has an outboard aileron coupled to the outboard of the other side. So, what is the reason why we break it up? Yes, there is one person here. So, what you are saying, you want to add something to that? You you try to answer. What is the, what is your point of view? Small and large change in. Small and large changes in? In the pitching. Pitching? No. Yes, ro rolling, rolling. In rolling. Okay. So, basically the division of aileron into two parts is driven by stress considerations. That if I actually deflect one piece aileron on a large aircraft, the loads can become very high and maybe the turn will be very sharp which may lead to inconvenience to the passengers. So, therefore, we have inboard ailerons which have a smaller moment arm, we have a outboard aileron which have a larger moment arm. When you want to have a split roll, you will deflect both of them. When you want a high speed roll, you can deflect only outboard. When you want to have a low speed board, but then at very high speeds, it may be too much to deflect outboard ailerons even by one small angle. So, you may like to deflect inboard ailerons because the moment arm, because the force is high because of high speed. So, in supersonic flight, you might turn using only the inboard ailerons because the moment arm needed is less, sorry, the moment distance needed is less. 
force is coming from the aerodynamic force itself. So, this is not in every aircraft, only in some aircraft. Location is in the outer trailing edge of the aircraft, function is roll control and the one that goes down gives you more lift, the one that goes up gives you less lift and this gives you a rolling moment. So, let us see one small clip of aileron in action and more so the effect of deflecting ailerons. Very simple video, pilot deflects the aileron and that is the outcome of that. In this case the pilot continues to hold the aileron, so therefore you continue to get the moment to go more than 90 degrees and then we level up and after leveling up you are back, okay. All right, let us see the next thing. Let us look at flaps. Oh, flaps are a little bit complicated in some aircraft. As you see in this aircraft, there are so many of them, okay. So, what is it? Location is the trailing edge inboard to aileron. Ailerons are always more than outside, outboard of the flaps. So, they are located inboard from the ailerons, but there could be many, many of them. So, what is the function of flaps? These are flaps on the trailing edge. So, their function is at low speeds, I would like to provide higher lift. We will study how we get more lift by the flaps. At the moment, I am not going to really start explaining the aerodynamics behind it because that comes later. Today, your task is, oh, where is the flap? What is the purpose? That is all. How is not important right now. Where, what, where and uh, some points about its usage. How it works, let us not worry right now, okay. Uh, flaps basically are of two kinds, outboard flaps, inboard flaps, okay. This division is done normally to alleviate the loads only. You will never have a situation where you will deflect maybe only outboard flap. Normally you will deflect both of them together, but the load is distributed so that we do not have any large structure with loading acting on it because the actuators which are going to deflect it, they are going to need lot of power and that will make the aircraft heavy. Now, we have a special chapter on high lift devices where we will study the various types of flaps. Right now, I am going to just show you some pictures, okay. This is a simple hinged flap like my wrist is a simple hinged flap, that is it. The whole thing moves down across the hinge, okay. So, it is also called as a plane flap, the most simplest flap. Where do you see this? In the most simplest aircraft, correct. Where, uh, remember one thing, in an aerospace, in an aircraft environment, we always want to reduce three things, cost, complexity, weight. We do not do more than needed complexity, cost and weight. So, here if you do not need anything more complex than plane flap, go for plane flap. If plane flaps are working for you, never go for anything more than the plane flap, okay. So, typically 20 percent of the wing is simply hinged. It could be slightly more 25 percent, even 30 percent, but 20 percent is typically the order. Split flaps are actually less effective because what we do here is only the bottom portion something comes down the top portion remains as it is. So, you have a split. So, just the last 20 percent of the wing forms it, top surface is stationary, lower surface moves, okay, right. Then we have more complicated, there are many, many, many types I am skipping. I want to come straight away to one of the most complicated types, these are the Fowler flaps. So, if you notice in this figure, these flaps are not only moving down, but they are also moving back. So, they are increasing the area also apart from the angle of deflection, okay. These are highly sophisticated, their mechanism is really complex. So, let us have a look at a small animation on the deflection and retraction of a Fowler flap. It is only an animation, but it will give you a clear picture. So, 
this flap is basically a, a single slotted Fowler flap. That means there is a Fowler flap and that to not one piece, there is one small piece behind which moves independently. You can have double slotted Fowler flap, you can have triple slotted Fowler flaps, but beyond that the complexity becomes so large that the advantages are not so much. So I have never seen a quadruple slotted Fowler flap, okay. So for the Moodle, there is one small assignment for you. Find out any aircraft that has got more than three slots, okay. I would really like to hear from you if there is some aircraft which has got quadruple or penta slotted Fowler flaps. I only know of three, maximum three and also identify one aircraft which has got a triple slotted Fowler flaps. And what you do is suppose we will play fastest finger first here. So the first person who says okay Boeing 747, the next person to want to say yes, yes I agree, that is not the purpose. The next person should say this also, this also, this also. So what will happen very soon we will have a nice list. So in my next presentation next year, I am going to just put a table saying these are the aircraft which have got a triple slotted Fowler flap. So one requirement is anything more than three slots in the trailing edge only, okay. I am looking at triple, more than triple slotted Fowler flaps and I am looking at also aircraft which are having a triple slotted or more than three slotted Fowler flaps. So the wing also, the area also goes up, the curvature also goes up which is called as camber. We will study this in the aerofoil section. That is the outcome. Unfortunately, it is very difficult to talk about a component and simply say this is the component. We invariably end up telling something about the functioning, but I am going to avoid it, okay. Slotted flaps are flaps where you create an air gap between the two moving parts or the three moving parts. This is an example of double slotted Fowler flaps, both inboard as well as outboard, okay. So what you do is you create a small gap and we will see later on what happens there, right. Moving on, so ailerons give you roll control, flaps give you lift improvement. What about aileron plus flap? What will you call it? Flapperon. So we have something called as a flapperon, which is an aileron plus flap. So when you want to move it like a flap, both of them move down. When you want to move like an aileron, one goes up, one goes down. So ek pe ek free. That is the offer. Okay, that's a flap around. So here is a flap around, which you can see, and this is the uh, images taken from uh, actual flight for some aircraft. It's a small piece between the inboard flaps and the outboard flaps, and it can move up and down, as I will show you in one video. Okay, so let's see how this is going to help us. So this is the video from start rolling to take off to some initial climb. Notice flap around has already started moving, it is going up because I do not want to create any deflection right now. So it has come down completely, that means it is now working as a flap. Focus only on this part right now please. Now you see, it starts dancing because the pilot wants to create small correcting rolling moments to take care. If you put aileron at this time, maybe you can see aileron is also reflected little bit, little bit, it is difficult to see, but he is trying to manage, he or she trying to manage with just the dancing of the flaperons to get the required moment. So now the aircraft has uh, gone into a climb, that is it, the job is over, take them inside. So the flaps are now being retracted, they are going to go down, they are going to go up sorry and they are going to become flush. But the flap around keeps moving because it is meant for minor corrections, okay. So this is the function of the flaps, they are down during takeoff and they are giving you enhanced lift, okay. What are these? Anybody knows? 
are they air brake or spoilers? They are spoilers. So, after landing, you want to kill the lift, you want to spoil the lift. So, what you do is you bring an obstacle in front. So, you just push this flat plate up and give higher resistance. So, it creates more drag which helps in reducing the landing distance, it kills the lift and it allows you to descend very swiftly without speed increase. Otherwise, your landing distance may become very large and your impact velocity also may become very high. These are deployed on landing, typically automatic as soon as landing gear touches down, spoilers will go up. We rarely deploy them in the flight, it is very dangerous, ok. Interesting thing is they are not air brakes, air brakes are different. I will talk about air brakes also, All right. Leading us devices. Now, here I also want to show you, I also want to discuss with you some very interesting information. Do you observe that the engine intake has a very peculiar shape? Can you describe this particular shape? What you see? Can you describe this shape? Anyone? Uh, it is rounding shape and a flat uh, bottom. It will have a flat at the bottom. Ah, so, you are saying it is round in shape and has a flat bottom. I would not say it is a round in shape. It is actually oval. If you look at the cross section, the ring is actually oval. So, what is this part called? The one that is covering the engine is the nacelle, N A C E L L E is the nacelle, it is the engine nacelle. Anything that is provided for a shroud or a covering over a part which is suspended in the airstream is called as a nacelle. This is the engine nacelle. The engine nacelle is not circular ok. What could be the reason? Why is it not circular? Now, let me tell you one thing, I will give you the background first. It was not like this earlier ok. It was made like this because we want to maintain some clearance from the ground. For any component of the aircraft, there is a unwritten or a written rule that you should be 18 inches away from the ground under all conditions of flight, ok. Except for something like tail skid which is going to rub on the ground, unless required by function, any component should never come less than 18 inches from the ground. Now, if I make this particular intake perfectly circular, it will probably become less than 18 inches clearance which can be dangerous. So, this has been done to increase the clearance, but why was it not possible to go for a circular thing which can be 18 inches away, ok. Why this horrible looking shape? Believe me, this shape is aerodynamically worse than a perfect circular intake, ok. So, on an aircraft like this, where even 1 percent higher drag it can be a real problem and the competition can actually win over you because you have got 1 percent more drag. Why would a designer permit something like this? So, this is the next question for the model. What is the reason for such awkward looking nacelle shapes, nacelle cross section in an aircraft? Hmm? So, the leading edge of the aircraft also contains certain devices such as slats. So, basically a flap in the leading edge is called as a slat, just a name. A similar function, it goes down, it has got a similar aerodynamic shape, but it is called as a slat. So, this is a fixed type slat, nothing moves here, it is like this right from the beginning to the end. This is the aircraft configuration, this red colored device is fixed, the gray colored wing is fixed, nothing moves, this is called as a fixed type slat. This is also an example of a fixed type slat where there are these members for structural rigidity. This is a fixed slat, ok. There are members which support it, ok. Why do we need this thing? We will come back later. In some aircraft, we have a retractable slat. That means, we have slats which can be retracted. 
okay we do not have the file here with us, but this flash can be retracted. So, just like the follow flap it can move back and close the gap between the two when not needed it can close the gap. These are the retractable type of slats okay. So, obviously the purpose of this is to make the aircraft smooth during cruise no gaps and no projecting parts in the fixed slat there will be more drag during cruise, but they are simpler. And then you have something called as a Kruger flap, a Kruger flap is actually a very sharp curvature flap right at the leading edge you can see here for example, this particular thing is like a flat plate which came down, but it has a small curvature like this here okay. Let us see. So, see how Kruger flaps operate this is the leading edge of the aircraft. So, these flaps are actually going to come out and cover up. So, these are the flaps which actually come down like this in the leading edge. So, they are called as a Kruger flap. All these videos are easily available on YouTube okay, so there is no problem in finding it okay. Have you observed these things below the wing we observed it in so many of the wings that we saw so far. So, what are these? Uh, th these contain the uh, arms which deployed. Correct very right they contain the tracks which on, along on which the, they house the tracks. So, this is also like a covering actually there are flap tracks there they will be horribly aerodynamic. So, you cover them with something like this. So, they are called as flap tracks okay or flap track fairings. Now, they come in different shapes some of them have very pointed thing on the back some are rounded generally they are aerodynamically smooth bodies provided to reduce the drag of the flap track fairings. If you do not have them it will be difficult to have flaps moving down okay. They are also called as Kukman carrots in respect of Kukman who was the person who did the aerodynamic design of the Concorde aircraft, but the purpose there is not just flap track the purpose there is to provide some savings in the drags. People also call it anti shock bodies because this can be used to manipulate the shock acting under high speed flight. Okay, and these flap tracks are the ones that house the mechanics. You have already seen this. Okay, let us put it all together now and see. So, this is the figure that I showed you in the beginning, the figure on the bottom left which shows uh, the working. So, now let us see the whole thing working together again. So, so, now this is on the ground notice what happens this is testing on the ground these are the flat track fairing I think we will just proceed ahead I will try to show it some other time. These are your air brakes okay these two on the back these are the fuel large on the rear opens up like this and creates intentional drag. So, these are load bearing members you can see there are two arms coming here which carry the load and they are going to give you the increase in the drag. So, I will show you a small uh, clip of BAE 146 landing. Notice the drag on the back. They open up there are no spoilers here okay, but they use a speed brake or an air brake. Look at the runway it is not straight okay it is up and down why is that so 
because it is very difficult and very expensive to flatten a place of 3, 4 kilometers. So, there are certain runway waviness permitted by the regulatory bodies. So, if you are within that, it is acceptable to have a runway with such kind of waviness. So, you can see an example of spoilers deflected, flaps deflected and this is the flap around. Okay. Then you can also have them like this which come in a very large way. So, you can see here for example, many fighter aircrafts just behind the cockpit because that is a place where you have a maximum drag, total frontal area is exposed to this particular thing. So, imagine the load which comes on this air brake. Okay. Let us see a small click. Now, what I would like you to know is this is a component which is heavily loaded. You will agree with that? So, for your information, when we had MiG 21 aircraft in this country, now it is uh, almost obsolete. There used to be a metallic air brake on MiG 27, or MiG 21, and uh, the Composites Laboratory of IIT Bombay Aerospace Department was given the task of creating a composite air brake. Okay. So, the first carbon fiber stressed structure to fly on any military aircraft in India was a speed brake designed by Professor Lutkert and his team of our department. So, when I was working in HAL, I used to associate with Professor Lutkert in installation and testing of this airspeed brake. Before that, all composite materials used on aircraft were only some hash door, some covers, maybe fin leading edge, non-stressed parts, only aerodynamic covering parts which were not heavily stressed. The first stressed component was the carbon fiber air brake. I do not remember how much weight was saved, it was a massive weight saving just by one component. After that, the MiG-27 air brake was also converted into a composite air brake. Alright, this is the fuselage or the body and the various parts that are attached to it. Notice here the front of the fuselage, you can see this yellow colored, uh, what do you think that is? What would that be or what is it called? I am talking about this part, this part in the front. So, this is something that you have to now figure out and tell me what it is. What did you call that part? This yellow colored part on the front of the fuselage. Let us look at types of fuselage. This is the single fuselage type, but can you identify the aircraft? A380. Why A380? How are you so sure? But even 747 is double decker and 4 engines. Yeah, but it's, uh, it's not double decker, it's the double so, you should have said that first full cabin length double decker transport aircraft with 4 engines. No need to say 4 engines, there is no other aircraft. Even with 0 engines, there is no aircraft available today which is double decker from length to the tail, nose to the tail. Okay. So, this is a conventional fuselage. This one is a twin boom. Now, we will not go into the details right now, why do we, this is twin fuselage, not twin boom, there are two fuselages and notice there are two cockpits. So, who is the boss? Do you think there are two engines? So, are these two aircrafts welded together to save money? Think about it and then this is only fuselage, no fuselage sorry, only wing, this is called as a blended wing body, BWB. This is the shape of the aircraft of the future. What is expected is that in future the aircraft would be like that. Okay. 
so these are type of fuselages okay let's focus on twin boom fuselage that was a vampire aircraft cessna sky master and many many uavs are like that available this is the twin mustang and white knight white knight is very famous what does it carry not the space shuttle it carries something like a space shuttle it carries a small aircraft that can be used to give you a experience of near space flight it's a carrier for a another aircraft what is it called come on you should know this this is simple general knowledge okay i don't want to tell you look at the website of virgin galactic and you will get the answer there is designed by bert rutan okay this is a uav pegasus x47 this is also a uav so what is meant by this apu auxiliary power unit so this is the location right on the back on the tail on the on the on the rear part of the fuselage this is where you normally see an apu in some cases you can clearly see the exhaust pipe of an apu so apu basically is a small engine separate engine and you can see now the apu has been opened up so it's a gas turbine engine that provides power for ground operations it runs accessories and the systems when the engines are shut down and it also provides the power to start the main engine without apu you to start the engines you will need external power that means you have to depend upon the airport for providing that much power so apu is a small starter for the main engine okay now let's look at one scenario yeah on the sides of the fuselage there are small um lubes which allow the air to be sucked in so it's not a jet engine it's a turbo prop engine so therefore it just needs some air so there is a intake manifold normally on the sides good any other question so let's look at this scenario during flight the two engines or four engines all have failed then the apu should help you out apu also has failed can it happen can happen okay this happened in the flight called air canada complete loss of power so what does the pilot do in this case yes what do you think so there can be catastrophe and safe landing so we have rat okay this is the aircraft which landed safely so this is what aircraft carry with them they carry an animal which will provide power no 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 rat is a ram air turbine it's a small turbine that comes down below when needed and it creates it gives the required is the required power so i have lost all the power and i don't have a rat with me okay so it generates power from the ram pressure of air stream the small fan which is mounted below this fan will start rotating when it picks up some minimum speed it will start generating power and the usual location of rat this is where the rat is you will see this is how it comes out and starts rotating and this is for the ground for maintenance purposes this is how it goes back inside all right so we also have something called as a tail skid is there yes 
ram air turbine yes so ram air turbine is only able to give a small amount of power which can only run the main functional components it cannot run everything so it will run only one hydraulic system which is required for safe landing it will not run air conditioning unlike apu it will not run other uh, passenger entertainment systems movies etc may not run so it's a small turbine for emergencies for just the minimum power okay yeah uh, ram air turbine don't increase the drag but what is the option everything else has stopped working now i need something that works like a windmill purely on the function of the ambient speed of the aircraft and i wanted to be completely independent it should not be connected to anything so the ram is lowered by the pilot manually there is a ram deployment lever is not deployed hydraulically because you can assume there is no hydraulic oil or no pressure available so sometimes there is a small wheel or there is a jack or a kind of a lever so they want a system which is completely self sufficient which can bring their aircraft down safely in emergency so what exactly will it power sir? the control surface or yes it will power one of see an aircraft normally has three hydraulic systems okay we call them as yellow blue green so it will power one of the control systems which will be connected to the primary flight surfaces so it may move only one rudder only one inboard ailerons okay may only move some flaps so it will be used to power only the minimum things required for a safe landing so therefore the power requirements are also limited all the emergency systems that you need landing gear retraction uh, extension it will be powered by ram otherwise everything is fine but you cannot come down okay sometimes it doesn't work also sometimes it doesn't give enough power those things also happen but they wanted to have a system so that in case there is a situation then we have something okay so tail skid is a very interesting device uh, obviously you can see that tail skid is essentially trying to uh, what is it doing avoiding the rubbing of the fuselage on the ground and very costly repairs for which the aircraft has to be shipped to the manufacturer so what you do is you have a disposable kind of a skid it rubs but why is it needed why will an aircraft go at an angle such a large that the fuselage will hit the ground when can it happen yes loudly please that means in a large aircraft routinely there is a tail skid which gets burnt away if i say that it is used mainly in landing then yes you what you say is not wrong it's correct but that's not the main driver yes loudly please okay some kind of disturbance so this is not something that you desire to happen okay it's 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 like uh, a safety device okay when it happens this is a trial trial flight you can see it starts hitting The second run appears to be a success, but with time pressing, the ground crew races to the aircraft to discover that despite a more controlled takeoff, the shredded skid will need replacing once more. Unfortunately, there's a limited number of the specially engineered skids available, so the crew know that they can only afford. So this is the tail skid, which has got this portion which can be worn away. and replace but as you saw in this test even the rear fuselage end scraped little bit and because of that they have to now change the skin change the skin on the on the bottom 
to use one skid for every two runs. From this point on, even the slightest error could put the entire campaign on standby. This is that, this is that skid. Which bears away. Yeah. Small. Mm. And that wheel will will break and go inside the fuselage because of the high impact. So, they have decided that the best way to overcome a very uh, bad situation, even with the skid you saw that the, the rear was slightly damaged, but imagine if there was no skid then the whole of the rear fuselage conical thing would have, have to be changed. Yes. No, no. The skid contains material which will wear away without damaging the runway. So, the it uses cork or some other such material. It is a very interesting thing. In fact, it is one of the challenging materials to be used. What is the material to be used so that the aircraft is protected but runway is not damaged? So, it is a very interesting material and a lot of research is done in designing or identifying the suitable material for the uh, tail skid device. Okay. Let us look at uh, the Redome. Redome is basically a cover, it is like a nacelle again. There is a radar inside the aircraft. You put a cover over it, it is called as a Redome. And it has a antenna. You can see the radome covers this antenna. This antenna is for which radar? What kind of radar is this? Yes? No, it is not omni because it is not going behind, it is going only 180 degrees. It is a weather radar. This is a transport aircraft, they do not have to hit any targets or drop any passengers somewhere. They are basically going to scan the weather ahead of them. So, therefore, it has to move 180 degrees. And if you if you do not have the cover, you know what will happen. So, just to cover it up, you have this red ohm. Hence, the material in the red ohm has to be radar transparent. So, one of the first modifications that was done by us in India. Uh, was to when we worked on the Dornier 212 aircraft in Kanpur was to build the Redome in India. So, very expensive Redome used to come from Germany. So, a small composite laboratory was set up. Redome is a non load carrying body except for the loads which come in the front. Okay. It, it does have aerodynamic loading, but it is not impact load or something. So, we were able to do it and we were able to save a huge amount of foreign exchange instead of buying it from the Germans every time. Now, we make our own Redome and uh, after that we began supplying Redome to other countries and other places also. Okay. These are the stabilizers. Stabilizers basically are moving surfaces either partially moving or fully moving on the rear of the aircraft which allows it for the longitudinal balance. This is the longitudinal axis. So, to avoid uncontrolled pitch we have stabilizers. So, now let us see also a small film on trimmable stabilizers. You can see here you can actually adjust the whole surface to provide the required moment. So, this is not moving in the air during flight. During flight only the rear portion moves. This is adjustment of the whole thing on the ground before the flight, adjust and lock so that you get a constant moment to balance it. Yeah. You can see the close up of the Airbus A319 with these positions at which the pilot can or the flight operator can prefix it. And this is on Embraer EMB 170 again you have up and down controls on the angles. 
this is conventional where you have a tail plane here and the wings here. You could have canard in which the tail is in the front like this or like this. These two canards are different. One of them is a control canard, one of them is a lifting canard. Now this distinction I do not want to tell you, I want you to figure out on model and tell me. In fact, there are three types of canards. There is a close coupled canard, there is a lifting canard and then there is also a um, control canard. So you have to tell me what the differences are and how they are. This is a very interesting plane which has got a canard also and a conventional tail also. So we call this as a three surface aircraft. You have canard, wing and tail and we talk about this aircraft a lot in our aircraft design course. I do not want to spend that much time here because uh, in the aircraft design course of course this will be covered in more detail. Then you have elevators. This part is the elevator which is the movable part of a tail. Sometimes we have all moving tails also mostly in military aircraft but transport aircraft normally you have a fixed part called as a stabilizer or a fin and the moving part called as the elevator. All right. So now the interesting thing is that here you have an elevator and you have a small deflecting surface over the elevator. So what is this? A small elevator on the elevator. This is a trim tab. This is a tab which is a small deflecting surface but a fixed surface. So you deflect it at some angle and lock it. It is used to reduce the hinge moment required to operate the stabilizer. We will study about this more when we do st the stability. Okay. So trim tabs basically they reduce the force on the control yoke or control stick and they are meant for trimming the aircraft. All right. This is a vertical stabilizer which is a flat surface sometimes 1, sometimes 2, sometimes 3 on the center line of the aircraft, on the rear side in the front. It gives directional stability. So it gives you the tendency to avoid going into a yaw uncontrolled. If there is a disturbance, you will fly straight. If there is a disturbance, you will avoid going this far. You may go and then come back. Okay, That is called stability. We will discuss about it. But it also has a small moving part called as a rudder which is meant for intentional motion. So the pilot deflects the rudder to intentionally go into a roll or into a yaw but the fin or the vertical tail is needed for stability. Okay, So vertical tail can also be conventional like this just a single one Okay, directly on the empennage most common, most common configuration but you may also have a T tail that looks like a T. This is also a tail but that horizontal tail is moved up and away. You can also have a twin tail that means you have two tails mounted at the ends and why do we have them? What is the advantage etc. that we will discuss in the aircraft design course. Uh, then you can have a again the twin boom, twin tail and you can also have something like a V tail. This is F117A and this is the Beechcraft model 35. It has got a butterfly or a V tail. Here instead of three surfaces, vertical 1 and 2 horizontal, you have just two surfaces. So apparently it reduces on weight, reduces on drag. Okay, but read about this more. It's a very interesting configuration, and there are not many aircraft. There are only about four aircraft that I know which have a vertical tail. Then you have triple tail. Again, I have not seen a quadruple tail. Although there are some aircraft in the beginning which had multiple tails just for trial purposes, like the Lures. Okay, now. Uh, in this picture, I want you to focus your attention on the part which is required when the tail is not enough. Then you have to have extra things and that is a ventral fin. 
this is the MiG-23 with the ventral fin. Okay, what is the ventral fin? Something mounted at the rear underside of the fuselage. It improves responsiveness towards rolling. We will see this when we look at the stability classes and it also improves the directional stability of the aircraft. That means if the aircraft has a tendency to go into this kind of a motion, it will have a force acting on the back on the bottom, it will try to bring it back on itself. So it is not common in many aircraft. In some aircraft like in Mi-27, there is a very interesting configuration that as soon as the aircraft touches down, the ventral fin will bend 90 degrees because if it does not bend, it will hit the ground and it may break especially at high angle. So we wanted to have a large ventral fin, but we did not have uh, space to mount two of them. There was only one in the center. So they have a coupling system. The moment landing gear is hitting the ground, it is sensed that it has touched the ground by some pressure and as it is activated, the ventral fin becomes 90 degrees bent. That is an interesting configuration. Okay, Podded engines is basically jet engine engines inside a pod which is basically a nacelle about which we have already spoken. There are many, many variants. You have under wing mounted which is most common and the Boeing aircraft company was the first aircraft company to try out these kind of configurations below the wing podded engines and they made it work very well from Boeing 707. After that, every jet engine normally has this and there is a member, there is a member which connects the wing to the engine and that engine is this particular component and that component you can see it here also this is called as a pylon okay because it is used to pile the engine on the aircraft that is why it is a pylon that is the way I remembered it okay. You can also have a pylon for any external store like a bomb or a missile or a rocket pod that will contain the electronics, weapon control system and other devices. In many aircraft stores or armament, you need to have an ejector so that you can push the store down to avoid the store hitting the aircraft. You know, uh, if you release a bomb, a bomb is an aerodynamic body and it is a body which can actually start floating up because of the aerodynamic forces. So much so that it may hit the whole aircraft which launched it. There have been such cases where you have damaged your own aircraft by lodging an armament. The worst offender are the drop tanks because drop tanks are basically external fuel tanks which are mounted generally on the bottom of the fuselage or on the two wings below the wing. They carry extra fuel. So if you want to have larger range, especially in military aircraft. What they do is they mount one or three drop tanks and then they consume the fuel from drop tanks first and then you release them and then you switch over to the internal fuel. So by the time you take off, climb and reach some place, you now have full internal fuel for the mission. Now these drop tanks are lightweight now because fuel is gone, large aerodynamic bodies, they float and they may hit. There have been many studies. One of the last things I did when I was in HAL Nasik was to look at the aerodynamics of store separation and today also it is a very big area of study, okay. But you could also have engines over the wing like these two examples. There are also more examples and then you can have engines over the wings or halfway over the wings in the front. This particular uh, variation is called as the upper surface blowing or USB where the exhaust of the engines is used to flow it over the wing. So this is called as powered lift. You combine the propulsion with the aerodynamics by using the exhaust of the hot engine flowing over the wing, okay. Again there are many variations. You could have engines mounted on the back with pylons coming out such as in this particular example. Okay. Now, the question is why are these configurations normally seen 
only on small jet planes. Do not answer it now, read about it and answer on the Moodle page. Why is it so that most large transport aircraft they will have engines below the wing, but most or many small jet engine aircraft, especially business jets, luxury jets, they may have engines mounted in this fashion. Okay. So, what could be the reason? You have to figure out by looking at the model. Again, more variations single engine mounted above with a butterfly tail. Yes. Yes, MD-90, see MD-80, uh, there are there is one variation which has got one in the tail and two in the fuselage, okay. Uh, yeah, that is not a very small jet, but generally you will find large jets we do not have like MD-90, normally they are mounted below the wing. It is only in the small jets that you basically have uh, examples of this, okay. This is the most useful thing as far as the pilot is concerned in case of any emergency. The pilot uses this to save life. This is the ejection seat. I do not know whether we have a video of this embedded. In the skies over Calgary, an F 18 pilot practices maneuvers for an air show, would be cheating death. Last control. Had he bailed when the plane was still horizontal, he might have floated straight. But when one pilot gets a signal cross, team with a daring high speed pass, slammed into his friend, Ooh. breaking it in two. Seconds after the collision, Sergei ejects. He cannot find Alexander. All he sees is a rage. As we watch again, we can see that Alexander is able to eject from the fiery fuselage just in time. But after a turn out of the square loop in the midst of slow flight at 500 feet, something suddenly and dramatically went wrong with the right engine. Harrier. Crash landing, nose broken. Pilot is still waiting. The, the plane is on fire. But when the fire reaches there, then the pilot will eject. Very risky to wait for so long till the fire is coming in the front. Okay. So, all these are ejection seats, and many a times they happen accidentally also while doing maintenance some mechanic or someone does something and then another mechanic is launched. It has happened. We are laughing but people have died. I, I know of cases in HAL where there was a false ejection like this and the poor mechanic hit the ceiling and he was literally unrecognizable because of the sheer force, okay. So, uh, one ejection took place by Wing Commander Rakesh Sharma when I was the aerodynamicist also. He was coming into land and 10 kilometers before the Ozher runway, there was some problem which was further investigated, but he was able to eject. After ejecting, he came down and he got stuck in a tree and then from the tree he had a fall, so he broke his ankle. He was, he was without flying for about 3 or 4 months, but then obviously he came to the um, HAL and there was a huge party for the ejection cell team because the ejection seat worked and saved his life. Okay, right. I would like to just spend very few minutes about um, while collecting data for this particular course, I came across this very nice documentary of the first female fighter pilot in Asia, okay, Lieutenant Maryam Mukhtiar, who was from Pakistan. So, there is a very interesting story that this is the FT 7 PG, is a Chinese aircraft. You can see there are two, what do you see? Two ventral scenes are mounted, and what about the intake? It is a nose mounted intake. So, this is a, an authorized licensed version of a Chinese aircraft 
which was a copy of a Russian aircraft, okay. It took off with one quadrant leader as the teacher and Mariam Mukhtar as the flying officer and you know there was a crash and there is a very beautiful documentary documenting her life and also this whole incident. The most uh, you know nice thing to know is that she could have saved her life by ejecting early but she decided to divert the plane away from the population and in the process save the life of people on the ground. There was she was going to hit a school and she said there are going to be many casualties of young children and instead of that she tried to steer the plane which is having a malfunction. Her captain has ejected and he saved his life but she ejected late and she gave her life for the uh, welfare of the people on the ground, okay. So this was uh, the first martyr also. I think uh, I would urge all of you to go to YouTube and search for the documentary. It's a very beautiful document. I really enjoyed watching it. Okay, so that's it. I think uh, that was what uh, I had in mind. So the next is homework time. So that is a homework for you in this particular course. Let's see what is this. I think there are some videos towards the end which we can because we have a few minutes remaining. We can have a look at the elevator trim tab. This airplane also has a pilot controlled trim tab. When we take this trim tab and we run it to example the up position in the cockpit, this makes the elevator actually go in the opposite direction, which in essence with the airflow pushing that up will raise the elevator like this. The pilot can control this for all attitudes of flight and reduce the back pressures and neutralize it. The idea when flying an airplane is actually that we only use a couple of fingers and that the trims should do all the work for us. the APU. That's it, that's all I have for you.